So hello everybody, one minute before we go. First I would like to uh, really apologize if some of you were here yesterday because there was supposed to be a session on this same subject but there was a mismatch in my schedule. I was quietly sitting in the other hub waiting for my next session and uh, I really did not have it. So I'm packing two sessions into one, hopefully today, so that I can recover what I missed yesterday. I really apologize for this. It was my fault in the end. Anyway, as you saw from the program, this session is called Color Correction for Digital Textile Printing. Hmm? Uh, I proposed this title and then thinking about it, I, I'm not quite sure it is the right title because there is no such thing as color correction proper for digital textile printing. There is color correction, period. We deal with different formats, different kinds of images, different kinds of problems, and mostly different kinds of outputs, which is what we are interested in. Okay, so um, let me tell you first what I do, who I am. My name is Marco Livotto. I was trained as a physicist, and for some weird reason, I ended up working in the field of image color correction, and I do mean static images, not movies. That's a different kind of area. I was a student with Dan Margulis, who is this American guy who literally invented, or at least encoded, what we call color correction today. And the interesting thing is that he was the, the first one, and possibly the only one, trying to build a bridge between the old analog technologies that actually worked when we worked with plates and films and everything, mostly in the pre-press field, in his case, and move that into Photoshop trying to understand how the workflow could be reproduced with the same good results that were obtained in the past and with the new challenges of color management having different devices available and so on. So it's a very complex subject in the end. Um, other than producing images for pre-press, what I do is teaching. I write for a magazine in Italy and all, I am a consultant as well. If any of you can speak Italian, there is a website there, www.teacherinabox.it, and you can find something like 40 hours of uh, video training that I did for them. It's the biggest company in Italy in the field of Photoshop and related subjects. All right. Before we start talking about color correction, a very brief definition because uh, I know that there is a lot of confusion in the field about what color correction is and is not. So let me tell you first what, in, in a nutshell, what is color management, okay? Color management is um, a theory, actually a scientific approach to color consistency. Um, with due limitations, because uh, it's not uh, as easy as it may sound, it guarantees that you get coherent color through your workflow. As we say, from shooting to press in the end, or whatever it is your output. It's a very complex subject because nowadays you don't have only printout in the end, you have the web, you may have multimedia, you may have electronic uh, books, whatever it is, and they're all different output medias, and so you have to care for that. The important thing is that color management, uh, curiously, has nothing to do with image quality in itself. What I mean is, if you have a picture with a horrible green cast, or it could be magenta or red if you wish, but color management just mm, ensures that the horrible green cast is reproduced on paper. It doesn't remove the cast. That's the field of color correction, which is then different from color management. Okay, color correction is based on the idea of going image after image and intervene so that the output is uh, optimized, uh, sorry, so that the image is optimized for the output condition we have in mind. Okay, so, next definition, what is color correction? I just told you. It's a series of techniques with a theory behind that are aimed to improving images. Now, this sentence sounds like fake, because what do you mean, improving images? Is there any way we have to 
declare that an image is better than another because it's so subjective in the end, you know. Think of artistic photography. It's an emotional level that speaks to you. So it's very different to assess what you mean by the best possible image. So we should restrict ourselves to the field of commercial imaging. And I mean imaging for advertisement, images on anything that needs to be sold through images or any way that mean to communicate to a large mass, all right? Uh, in my opinion, the best image is the one which attracts more attention of the from the customer, all right? Um, let me give you a couple of examples on this. I'm moving to Bridge and I'm showing you this picture. Okay, I couldn't say this is a bad photograph. We've seen more, we've seen worse, of course. But think of it as a postcard. Suppose that this postcard is for sale in some kind of shop. And next to it, you have another postcard, which looks like this. The question is, if you take 100 average people walking into the shop, how many will buy this postcard? And how many will buy this one? I can tell you, because I made this test on my classes and in my workshops. Okay, let's make a test. Raise of hand. You're walking into the shop and you are faced with the choice between buying this postcard and this postcard. Who would buy, who would buy the first one? Raise of hands. Nobody has hands, all right? Who would buy this one? Okay, so the result you see is common throughout cultures. This is true in Italy, this is true in America, this is true everywhere. Um, for some reason, and I know why, the second picture is perceived as better. Let me give you another example, please. This is what we call, by the way, the before and after. Before the correction and after correction. Okay. Here's an interesting animal. That's a white lion. Okay, this one was photographed by a professional photographer during a safari in South Africa. Hmm? It's not an albine lion. It's a completely different breed from the regular lions you are accustomed to. All right? Um, as well, we've seen worse, but I don't think that this is what we've seen, we, we should have seen, if we had been there when he took the picture. So, I've been a bit aggressive this time, and my proposal is this. This looks like a real lion. I don't know how much it shows through the main screen, but the main problem you have in this picture is that the lion is greenish. Well, it has to be greenish in a way because it's under the leaves. But let me please tell you a true story. This is absolutely true. It doesn't involve the lion, it's, it involves a bear, but it's more or less the same. When my son was four years old, we were walking through a park, you know, and you know, four years old boy have a certain attitude to make their parents look completely stupid at times, yeah? Probably you know. And what happened was that my son told me, I've seen a green animal, what it is? Uh, my guess was that it was a grasshopper because there aren't so many intensely green animals around, some lizards maybe. But we were in northern Italy, not in the tropics, you know. And so I thought it can't be a tropical bird. Huh? There is no way it can be a snake. So a grasshopper was most likely choice. And I was true, of course, I was right. Um, and my boy told me, no, you can name every possible animal, but not a grasshopper. Because I'll say that in the end. And of course, the meaning was, and you look stupid at that point. And so I played the game and started naming all possible animals. Was it a, a green lizard? No, it wasn't. Okay, was it a green parrot? No, it wasn't. Was it a mamba snake? No, it wasn't. And in the end, I said, okay, I give up. And I said, no, it was a white bear. And my son looked at me and said, well, there are no green bears. So how, how could it ever be? Now, you, you should see the boy had a small camera and he knows how to use it at the age of four. Now the boys are like that. They 
shoot, they look at it, no, it's bad, throw it away. This is wh what we have come to, so we have a problem indeed. <laughs> they, they will be adults in 20 years' time, so uh, they will be a, a lot more accustomed with technology than we are. Hmm? And so I said, okay, but imagine there is a white bear lying under a tree, exactly as you see this lion, you know? And uh, you take a picture with your small camera, and what happens is that the picture turns out green because the, the light reflects on the leaves and there is a green cast. Believe it or not, my son looked at me as if I were completely stupid and said this, Daddy, if the bear turns out green, the picture is wrong because with my eyes I would see it white. And this is absolutely true. We adapt, cameras don't. This thing is so incredibly clear to a four years old and then we spend hours, you know, weeping ourselves with the problem, should I correct this picture? Of course you should. There hasn't been a green lion around ever. So it's not that green, I realize, but for a number of reasons that, believe it or not, depend mostly on our evolution, that the camera hasn't, we would see something more similar to this. Now, I realize that you could consider this as a very aggressive correction, so let me show you this. I've done it in steps. This was the original, and I claim that this has better color and better contrast, and that the lion is a lot more defined. Let me go quite close. Look at the detail. Look at the variation in the fur. Look at how the contrast with the leaves is more pronounced. So, incredibly, the, li the lion is darker, but it is more separated from the leaves than it was before, all right? And if you're not satisfied with that, we can add some color variation and have this very three-dimensional lion, which is a lot more believable, I think, than the original. Let me go 100% and show you how much detail was engineered in this picture. If you think this is too much, you always have the choice to say, okay, I don't want to go too far, and I'll just reduce the opacity of this layer. And yes, I will give it some boost, but not as much boost as it was before. So it's something you can tune. If you're working for a client, you always have opacity and masks and all sorts of tricks you can play and pull in, Photoshop's, in Photoshop so that things come out better, all right? Um, my suggestion is, when you deal with color correction, be a little bit more aggressive than you would normally be because you can always pull back. If you are too shy and don't push it far enough, then it's likely that you will have to redo your image again. And that means time, and time means money. All right? So the idea, never underestimate the good taste of your clients. <laughs> All right? This is the, the final idea. OK, so much for the two examples which are not even as extreme as you may think. But I would like to give you rule number zero at this point, rule number zero, that there is no such thing as a perfect image, not ever, all right? What you have, what you can have, is a well-optimized image for your output conditions, as different as they might be, of course. And to me, output conditions ultimately mean Game it. That is the available palette that a device has to paint your final result because that's what it is. Hmm? The word game it is quite interesting because Shakespeare used it first and it was referred to music. In one of the comedies, I can't remember which one, he says that the game of the notes necessary to build that certain melody. So it was the range of notes that you needed to do so. And we turned that to color. And it means what we have available in the device, basically. Let me give you a very provocative thought. This is a very extreme case. You bring me an extremely colorful image and give me this printer, this 
printer is actually a black and white laser printer I have on my desk. You know, I print my email on it and very little else. All right? But you give me this with a colorful picture and say, okay, print that. I would like to remind you that this device has the smallest gamut ever seen because it can only print black dots. It doesn't print any gray. It's an optical illusion. The white comes from the paper. So if you use pink paper, you will have pink and black, not black and white. All right. Um, so you can't imagine anything printing less color than this. And then you want me to print a rainbow. All right. I have solution number one. I sit on the floor and cry, possibly for the rest of my life, because there is no solution. A bit of lateral thinking brings me to solution number two. I optimize the image for the best possible black and white result and print it. My question is which solution is better and which one yields a result? I think it's the second. And this is very provocative because it's such an extreme case, but if you think of CMYK, it's just like a black and white printer, only it has slightly more colors crying because our RGB files are so vivid and bright and then we have to go to say fabric and we can't achieve that kind of result is completely useless that's the limitation of the output you know if you're printing to newspaper there's so much you can do at the point you hit a brick wall and the brick wall is the end of the game it can you give me a more vivid blue? No, I can't. Oh, yes, I do. But you have to shell out a lot of money for a fifth ink, or a sixth ink, or 13 inks for maybe. And it's going to be a very difficult process because we have to make custom separations. So, you know, it's a trade-off between the result, quality, how large the gamut is, and the cost of the process. It's very easy, you know? So, golden rule coming from this small lesson of the black and white printer is that if you try to force your output device where it can't go, this won't work. But if you try to optimize the image so that the output is uh, as good as it can possibly be, this is a good solution. You only have to accept the limitations of the output. So. Let me tell you something about soft proofing, which is one of the hottest discussion areas in forums and uh, it can start flame wars at any time. Um, there is a very widespread misconception that your final output should match your screen. This is true to an extent, but it's not universally true. Um, because, of course, we need some kind of preview. That's obvious and we hope that it gets reasonably close to satisfy the client but the problem is not posed in the right way and the solution proposed that the screen should be the reference and the output should be what matches the screen is sorry very much doomed and let me show you why this is the common model that people have in mind you take a picture wow very colorful Tuscany in Italy in the springtime. You can get any more color than that, really. And, uh, and then you watch it on a monitor. And on a monitor you have possibly, you know, it's a second picture, more or less right color, but it's too bright. Okay, it's too vivid, too luminous if you want. And then you print it. And what you get is this, that the luminosity is more or less correct, but the color is reddish and the saturate. Okay, so you have a mismatch between monitor and printer. Um, this is the wrong way to go. Because uh, in the previous set of slides, I fooled you, okay, into believing that you can actually see the original. You can't. You see a representation of the original on the monitor. Suppose you have a black and white monitor just for the argument's sake. The original is in color, but what you see is black and white. There's not, nothing you can do. It's a bad representation of color. It may be wonderful, 
as far as luminosity goes, but it has no color. That's what you have to deal with. Speak to anyone who was doing color correction and plate preparation on the old Cytex scanners. They had black and white screens to preview things. They looked at channels. There was absolutely no color preview. Because the original, what's written in the file, is numbers, and numbers need to be represented. Our task, and the color management task, is to give the best possible representation of those numbers. But saying that that's the original, it's like looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, that's me. No, it's not you. It's your reflection. It's not three-dimensional. It's not real. Hmm? It's a mirror image. It's exactly the same thing. So please swap the model. We have one original and the original can't be seen. And we have two different representations. The first representation is the one of the monitor and it's possibly, possibly too bright. But this is what we have. And the only thing we see because we don't actually see the original is that the printer is reddish and saturated. And this is a sign that there is a mismatch between the color workflow between the original and the monitor on one side and the, the original and the printer on the other side. But they are two different devices. They are not connected at all. Also because, let me tell you, this comes from the widespread misconception that in the digital age everything is clean, perfect, well-defined. Well, it is on a theoretical level. But then it all comes down to image representation. What you look on a monitor is light, and light, I'm sorry for you, is analog, it's not digital. It's an electromagnetic wave, you know? And monitors are electronic devices. They are subject to several drifts, uh, and they will get off their own calibration, and they will have to reprofile them. It's a very interesting world, and it takes a lot of time to do that. But in the end, the most important thing that must come through is that I'm sorry to remember, to remind you, that never, ever, in the field of imaging, anyone ever asked that a transparency looked like the cyberchrome output. Everyone accepted they were two different media. And when you were starting from a color negative, there was no preview at all, okay? You had to put that in your enlarger, make a proof print, look at the print and say, oh, it's yellow go with a yellow filter, or whatever it was. It's the proof that makes the reference, because we need to match the final output as much as possible. Which, I'm not being terroristic here, it doesn't mean that you don't have to soft proof. You have to soft proof, but you have to remember that it has limitations. The best thing you can do is have a very wide gamut monitor, which is quite costly, by the way, but there are a few models that really work well. Have, it, have good calibration standards, have a good profile, and use the correct workflow. But then the really dirty thing will be when the ink hits the paper or the tissue or whatever it is, the cloth, you know? Um, on this, on this subject, let me also tell you, uh, one thing that I wouldn't underestimate is that if I show you a print right here, you'll see something. And if we go outside in the sunlight, it's going to be different as well. And if we go under fluorescent light, it's going to be different. So you have to standardize your viewing conditions, being absolutely aware that anyone will see your result printed differently. even. Even a piece of cloth is different whenever you move around. Yeah? So there is no absolute thing. You can measure that color, of course. You grab your spectrophotometer, go like this, and say, oh, OK, this is cyan, and it has these coordinates. Yeah? Oh, there is a tiny problem. I never got an invoice paid by a colorimeter. I got an invoice paid by a client. You know? <laughs> so uh, don't hang on the instruments too much. Yeah, use your head. Because you have a head and the instrument doesn't. That's the bottom line. Okay, if we're talking about textile 
digital printing, and I do mean digital printing, so the new way, not the old way with traditional techniques, you basically find two different kinds of inks. The, one is based on pigments, uh, and it has a, sm a smaller gamut, but it gives you an easier workflow. Because when you print with pigments, drying, for instance, is a lot easier. Or you may want to expand your game, uh, and then you have to turn to dye-based inks. There are several, uh, several kinds, and I won't go into that, but you then have a more complex workflow in terms of preparation, in terms of treating um, the textile that you are printing on, in terms of drying, and so on. And, of course, you have higher costs. Hmm? Whatever you decide to use, regardless of what you choose, your job will finally go through a rip that is ultimately the software or hardware module that is driving your printer, no matter how small or large it is and what kind of techniques it uses. Having a rip means that you're going to have color profiles for your output conditions. They can be canned or custom, and canned I mean that your rip will come with a series, with a bouquet, so-called, of color profiles, and you can use those to emulate different output conditions. Hmm? But the right thing, if you are after quality work, is that you should make some kind of proof of your printer, measure the patches with a spectrophotometer, build your own profile through a software module that either comes with a RIP or it can be independent of whatever you go or whatever you do. And anyway, the profile you use, you have, should be used for previewing the image as you work. Because then you are always aware, in terms of soft proofing, as I told a while ago, of what's going to happen. Okay. Now, in the following, I would like to outline a general workflow for color correction, assuming that we have some kind of idea of what the output conditions will be. And to make things easier and understandable to all, I will use a standard CMYK profile, well knowing that for textile printing it can be different, but the idea is basically the same. And if you're planning to print your own vacation pictures on your desktop printer, the workflow is still the same. You should profile your printer, or at least get a canned profile and use that as preview, so that you're aware of what's going to happen, more or less, when the ink hits the media. All right. Now, I need to tell you something. What I'm going to tell you now in the remaining half an hour usually takes uh, two or three days full immersion for the concept to be grabbed completely. So some of the ideas that I will outline may seem very weird to you, but trust me, they work in the end. You've seen it in the previous images, all right? And uh, we basically have three steps to go. We first need to evaluate color somehow, because we can't trust our eyes too much. We need to correct color, and then we need to optimize for the output, all right? Um, most of the remain of the rest of this session is going to be interactive and I hope I can do it because I don't have a mouse it's very small here so bear with me if I get something wrong but I would like to start from a picture which is uh, well it has nothing to do with textile but I know from my classes that this is one of the most uh, um, interesting pictures to understand about color correction because it gives you, it's very funny, it gives you an idea, basically, of uh, how much of a detective you have to be to understand what kind of color you are looking after. Um, we are in Photoshop, of course, uh, because most of our preparation is uh, happening in Photoshop nowadays. And I've just reset the system to its default values. We only need two things to proceed so far, and I am talking now about color evaluation. I'm not correcting anything. I'm just trying to guess if the color is right. All right? Well, the starting point is a very simple um, consideration, which is simple enough that it may sound stupid. Like, every image has a significant lighter point 
and a significant darker point. By significant, I mean that I still want to retain some kind of information in that point. If you look at this image, you can easily, easily understand that the absolutely lightest point is a hole burned by the sun here. If you look in the info panel, even if you're not aware of uh, color reading, it's quite easy to see what happens. In RGB, you read 255 in all channels, which is what we call white. And the equivalent in CMYK is no ink at all. And any one of you expert into printing knows that this is a no-no, something that you do not want. This is something that we should care for, but at a later stage, maybe. All right? Um, the question is, do you think that this lightest point is significant, really? Would you, do you think that it may have some kind of uh, detail, texture, something that we want to retain? No. Nobody sees the point. So, this is the lightest point, but it's not what we are interested in, all right? Um, how do we find the lightest point in an image? I'll show you in a second, but let me first make two changes, two very important changes to the system. I'm going to use the info panel and I'm going to use the eyedropper, okay? If you wish, you may use the color sampler tool. It's basically the same thing, but uh, I am usually... I'm usually fond of the eyedropper because I can, only sh I, I can simply shift-click on the image and throw a sampler whenever I want without changing the instrument. The default in Photoshop is that you are measuring point sample, which means that when you move, when you hover on the image, you will see numbers in the info palette, and they are related to the very pixel that lies under the eyedropper. Okay? Well, you don't want that, because it could be a dead pixel. If you're working with a scan, it could be some kind of dirty. You could have a, a lot of chroma noise. So my suggestion is, well, it's more than a suggestion, change this to either 3x3 three three average or 5x5 five five average. I usually go with 5x5, five five, and if you're working on very large images, 11x11, 11 11, which is the next step, might be a choice. This means that when you are sitting on a pixel, what the system will do without changing the image at all, so don't worry, is measuring 5x5, five five, that is 25 pixels in a square around the pixel you're pointing at, average them and knock out the differences so you have a smoother reading, all right? And the second thing you should do in color evaluation, well, you can do that in CMYK if you wish. But what I suggest is different, is that you should change this to LAB color because it's easier. So the setup is this. On the info panel, you have actual color here, which doesn't mean RGB in principle. It means uh, the color space in which the image is encoded. So if you have a grayscale image, for instance, this will read grayscale. And if you have a CMYK image, this will read CMYK. But the important thing is that you force LAB readings over here. Yesterday, at the Digital Hub, I explained that LAB is a very useful color space for image manipulation and evaluation as well. I'll try to give you an idea, so trust me with the numbers, because it would take me one hour to explain everything. But before we read, let's see how we can find the lightest and darkest significant point. Um, what I'm going to do is use a very sorry, no mouse, <laughs> a very humble, a very humble layer called threshold. Unless you're into doing Andy Warhol stuff, this is not very interesting for the image, but it's an absolutely essential tool when you need to find the lightest point and the darkest point. L let me tell you how it works. It's possibly the simplest uh, the simple adjustment that you can find in Photoshop. It only has one single slider, and the slider goes from 0 to 255. The default is 128, that is 50% luminosity. 
What it does is it analyzes the image and whatever is lighter is painted white and whatever is darker is painted black. So it's quite obvious that when you throw this to the left, you are isolating the darker part of the image. And when you go to the right, you're isolating the lightest part of the image. Now, if I go like this, it can be very difficult to understand what's going on. So my suggestion is, uh, if you turn down the opacity to say 50% and you let a bit of the image show through, it's easier for you to understand what you're actually looking at. And uh, as I, if I go here, I can really see what's happening. Well, we don't care about the sun. We already know that it's not significant. But if you go closer, you can see that the lightest points we have are on the postcard, that's a postcard, on the bench, and here in the upper part of the cloth, all right, on the shoulder of the woman. I would like to find a white point. That's very easy for me. So my question is, what would you choose as a white point, the postcard or the dress? They are identical as far as luminosity goes. But try to think of the color. Do you think there is more chance blind? You know, you don't know anything about this picture. It comes from your customer. Do you think there is more chance that the paper be white or the cloth be white? The paper, okay. So, Sherlock Holmes, number one, we go and shift click on this here. And, and throw down a sampler. And the sampler is uh, now in the info palette. Now, for the shadow point, as we call it, the black point, is uh, its easier. These are the areas. And so we see that the darkest part of the image is in the hair and some tiny points in the middle of the trees, actually. What do you think is significant here, the hair or the trees? The hair, okay. And so we are now very happy because by means of the threshold point, of the threshold, sorry, adjustment, we have two points, one in the postcard, one here in the hair, and we've discovered that they are the extremes of our picture, and we will work on them. Now, bye-bye threshold, it was nice meeting you, but we don't need you anymore. Let me show you how I can evaluate color. Now, remember a rule of thumb, believe me, in LAB, okay, you have three numbers. The first one is very easy, L. If it's a dark color, it goes towards zero. If it's a very light color, it goes towards the other extreme, and that's 100. Not like in CMYK. The higher the number, the more luminosity you have. It's more or less like in RGB, but not 256 steps, only 100. The A and B are a bit more difficult because these two channels control the green magenta component, the A, and the yellow-blue component, the B. And I am not working in LAB, I'm working in RGB at the moment, but I am reading the color in, L in RGB. Let me show you. This is green, look at the numbers. You have minus 15 in the A channel, and you have plus 19 in the B channel, which means that you are biased towards green, and that's correct. Otherwise, if it were positive, you wouldn't have green vegetation, you would have magenta leaves, which, mm, unless we are deep in autumn, is very difficult. And the B channel shows you that you are biased towards the yellow, which is correct as well, because in the greenery, the green you look at is more yellow than it is blue. Yeah, it's a yellowish green. But the rule of thumb is negative numbers, cold tints, positive numbers, warm things. So, let me try this on you. This is wood, and it measures here, minus two, minus seven, which it means to me it is slightly green and definitely blue. Can you believe blue wood? Have you ever seen blue wood when it's not painted, and it's obviously not painted? 
I haven't. So my brain says, maybe there's a blue cast in this image. Let's have a look at the value of the postcard here. It's minus five, minus 14. It's biased towards green in the A channel and blue in the B channel. It's even more intensely blue. I haven't seen a bluish postcard in ages. So that's suspicious as well. Let me show you about the sand. It's minus two, minus one. We are very close to neutrality. That would be zero and zero, of course. But it's greenish sand, and I won't buy that. The stone, we expect it to be possibly neutral. I'm trying to measure something when, where you don't have moss making it green or something, but look here. This color is cyan, minus four, so it is green. Minus, uh, sorry, minus five, so it is green. Minus four, so it is blue. Now listen, we have blue wood, green bluish sand, blue stone, I think there is a blue cast. That's what color reading tells me. All right. The first thing, okay, um, you're probably very scared because we've been talking about this for seven minutes. Let me show you what would happen in real life when you're able to read color. I'll do it without thinking of speaking to you and simply saying what goes through my brain. Okay, wood, minus three, minus six, cold, too much green, too little yellow, too blue, blue cast, ended. 20 seconds. You become accustomed to reading the numbers and the numbers tell you where you are heading to. Well, actually, where the, pi the picture is and where you should be heading to, all right? But, we have a white point and a black point here that is a light and dark point, and we must deal with them. And I will do that by using the curves in RGB. Let's concentrate on the first, on the very first value here. We have, you know that in RGB, when you suppose that something is white or at least neutral, you must have identical RGB channels. That is, if I had, say, 230 in all channels, I would be very happy because that postcard would be white. Instead, I have an excess of green and excess of blue, so I must correct that. And how do I correct that? Not certainly by using the master curve, which only changes luminosity. I need to go curve by curve and say, okay, the red is 213, the green is 230, and the blue is 252. Traditional color correction tells you that the white point value should be around 245, so don't get to the bottom of the scale. Eh? Reserve a margin, otherwise it's like running on top of a building. You might as well fall down. Just run one meter inside and have some safety space to move later if you need. Uh, so, how do I handle the curves? The red is moved. I'm looking at the numbers. You see, it used to be 213. It went to 245. Notice how red the picture has become. Now, shift this to the red. 230 goes to 235. And the blue, well, it's far too high. Well, no problem, curves can also be damped in a way. Okay, so I have 245. If you are missing it by one or two points, it doesn't really matter. But 30 points is a bit too much. Now, please, have a look at the color of the picture. Sorry. I'm doing without the correction and with the correction. It's all warmer, which makes us suspect that things are going better with color as well. Now, what's happened at the bottom? 22, 19, 16. Traditional color correction gives you three values for the black point, which again are not 0, 0, 0, but 10, 10, 10 in RGB. So move this by a while. 
nine is, is fine. I don't care about being one point out. Okay, nine again. And nine again. Check if the light point is better. And there you go. Okay, finished. Let's see. We did, what we did was finding a high, uh, highlight point and a shadow point and forcing them to neutrality. You could say, how can you be sure that the woman has black hair? Because, you know, 10, 10, 10, or 9, 9, 9 in this case is basically black. The trick is, uh, it might as well be dark brown, but we would never perceive that because it's too dark. So you can force it to neutrality. Instead, you could have a point, a light point, that is not neutral, all right? So, now that I've done this, let me evaluate the color again. How do you read this? Before the slash, you have the color values in LAB before the correction and after the slash, after the correction. So, the wood was minus two, minus seven, bluish. Now it's plus two, plus two. It's a bit of magenta in the A channel, and a bit of yellow, I call that red. And to me, brown is a dark, desaturated red. So, that's the right color. The sand, it's definitely positive in the A channel, so a hint of magenta and eight points positive in the B channel, so it's yellowish, which is what we would expect from the sand. The stone, plus two, plus four. So everything's fine as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not even telling you about the skin tone because there are ways to, ask, to evaluate the skin tone as well. And my final result is uh, that with only one set of curves, and it would take me 30 seconds to do that in real time and without explaining what I am doing, I went from this version to this version. And no matter how uh, we are not in the best lighting condition, but the difference should be obvious. If you want to see the difference later, I can show it here on my computer. It's amazing. Because this particular picture, you know, it wasn't taken on top of a mountain in December. It was taken in a warm place, probably on a vacation. There is sun going down, so we expect that it is summer somehow. Look at the difference in color of the skin. This woman has been tanning probably, so we really want a warm tone. We wouldn't accept a cold tone in a picture like this. All right? If you want to go further, you could as well do on the same, sorry, on the same curves layer. But you can make another and go like this. Decide which one is the subject of the, of the picture explore it and uh, you may not see it on uh, on the on the screen but there is a small circle going up and down the curve going from the lightest point to the darkest point of a subject oh i'm sorry i want my mouse here all right okay and you go and make an S-curve, basically, in the correct range, which throws up the color, throws off the color completely. But if you switch to luminosity, what you have is more contrast. Because the principle of color correction is that the steeper the curve in the subject, the more the contrast you get. In a nutshell, this is it. How long does it take? one minute when you're able to do it. Is it worth? Oh, very honest reply. If you need to print 2,000 different images like this big in a magazine, maybe not. If you're doing a very high level, high class work, certainly yes. How can you do that? You can do that in RGB. You can do that in LAB, as I showed yesterday, and you can do that in CMYK. My recommendation is if you're into CMYK and you need to do high quality work, this is still the main way.
But of course, it takes time and you have to budget for that. Which brings us to... Okay. A problem like this one, we shall be discussing more this afternoon. When I took these pictures, these are my sister's twins, okay? Uh, I was not interested in the twins, I was interested in the blue jacket. <laughs> because it's the most out of game at blue I have in a picture, yeah? Uh, this is not a great picture, but I browsed for, tell, I think, three hours through an image bank trying to find a similarly catastrophic blue when it comes to printing and I wasn't able to find it because what I want to show you is uh, what I call the fool's mistake. When you are going to CMYK with an image like this, you must be prepared to lose color. Of course, I'm not talking CMYK plus spot colors. You can fix that with the fifth, sixth, seventh color. However, it's going to be difficult, but you can. But suppose you only have processed colors, you know, you know the, the, the chart of the colors. Okay, black is black, no problem. Yellow, yeah, very good. Bright, luminous, good for printing. Magenta, well, it defends itself. And then you have cyan, which is not cyan at all, if you look at what cyan is. It's a ratty kind of color, yeah? It's, uh, it's really, really poor. And, and we can't get better cyan, really, on process colors because it would be so expensive to produce that it wouldn't make sense economically. So you have to make do with this. Now, what happens? If you go proof setup and check that working CMYK is set, and working CMYK is simply the setup you have in your color settings. So I'm really emulating the European coated Fogra 39 conditions, okay? And then you go proof uh, game at warning. This function turns the image to gray where you have a problem with game it. I think we have a problem with game it. This is a very blunt instrument. It tells you you have a problem, but it, uh, it doesn't tell you how big the problem is. To understand that, you need to do something a bit more uh, sorry, a bit more refined, which is view proof colors. Let me point you at what happens in the jacket. Let me see. Okay. I have a shortcut and that's common Y. It doesn't happen much over there, but you can see that we are really losing a lot of color. And what I would like to show you is here. The problem, the real problem is here because we are not only losing color, we are losing luminosity. We are losing contrast. If you look at the, at the gentle movements of the cloth, the real problem is not that they are only desaturated, they are flattened in a way. It's posterization. So what's the fool's remedy, as I call it? Okay, why is this happening? Because I'm moving into a color space that has narrower gamut, gamut and I'm losing saturation. So what I should do is use hue saturation, target the jacket only. You only need to click and, and, uh, and drag. If, if a color is so isolated as this one, you can do without a mask or something and saturate as much as I can before the conversion. I need to squeeze everything out of it. And see what happens? Proof colors. I don't know how the screen will react to this, but yeah. The more you saturate, the color doesn't change, but you lose more and more shape. The true way to do this is that you have to desaturate the color. Sorry. You have to accept that the color is not going to be there, but 
at least save luminosity. Because, oh, <laughs> and a bit of color, please. Okay, like this. Because if you don't desaturate first, you see how much shape is lost. The color won't improve anyway. It's a paradigm of the black and white printing. Optimize your image for the output conditions. If you really need to have more color online, then you need a sixth color, whatever it is. Okay. Is there any question about this? I'm just uh, basically introducing what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Because there's going to be a session called The Game at Riddle and How to Solve It. This is not the only way. We have other works or workarounds. But in the end, we need to face the fact that we have different and sometimes awkward output conditions. Ask anyone working in a newspaper. They really have such a thin paper that won't accept too much ink. And you need to bring down the ink limit to, say, 200 to 120%, which means that you can have very good coverage of the paper, which means that you can't have a deep shadow, which means that your game it goes like this, it's crunched. Also, the paper is not hyper-white, so you don't have a white background. Everything conjures about good color reproduction. And if we need better, we need to improve the conditions. And improving the condition is either change the media, but sometimes we can't. We can't, we can't put uh, photographic paper on the body of someone. We need to print on textile, and textile is different than paper. But this is the idea. The idea is that when you work, as I did, with proof colors on, once you have set up your proof to whatever is suits your need, you are going to have better results if you are prepared to go image by image, of course. If for any reason you can't, there are several options, and I'll discuss them this afternoon. And the first option is simply, when you find a picture like this one, and I'm talking about the original, and you know it can be printed, you have a very quick, simple, fast option. Don't do absolutely anything. Then don't complain if the result is not satisfactory, though. It's a trade-off. Cost zero, result so-so. Cost like this, improved. Cost like this, and then you really start to happen. It depends on what you're doing, really, okay? So, I think I'm finished. Uh, this is the afternoon session, if you're interested, here, the Fabric Hub. And this is my blog. This is MO, that's me, on Photoshop. It's all around the moon, in a way. Uh, if there's any question about what I said, I'm very happy to answer that, if you wish.